The sacred is revealed in the ordinary. There is a beauty in this. But how do we discover the mystery of the sacred in our seemingly mundane existence? Welcome to Revealed, a podcast sponsored by Resurrection Catholic Parish in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Let's join our hosts, Katie McAllister and Tony Pickler, as they explore the lives of people, organizations, and resources that will help us delve into the sacredness of the ordinary. Welcome to Revealed. I'm Katie. And I'm Tony. And we are bringing the sacred into our ordinary lives. So, Tony, I got a question for you before we start our interview. What's that, Katie? All right. Who said this quote? I will always welcome joyfully any opportunity that comes my way to be of service to you. Hmm. I'm going to guess Dorothy Day. And you would be wrong. Mm. That would be St. Vincent de Paul. Oh. Yeah. And do you know why I chose this quote? Yes, I do. Because of our guest. And who is our guest? Our guest today is somebody that I've known for quite a few years. I first was introduced to Bill Gussie when he was a guest columnist, I would think you would say, for the Green Bay Press Gazette, writing about um, sports and families and parenting and how to do that well. And I was always intrigued by that column, Bill. It sounds and, right up your alley. Oh, you sports and, it, and parenting, that screams Tony, so I understand it, why you're a fan. And it was right up my alley. <laughs> and then after that, I you know, wasn't even sure what Bill was up to, but then I discovered that he was then the executive director for St. Vincent de Paul here in Green Bay. So, Bill, welcome to The Revealed Show. Thanks for having me. So, Bill, can you just kind of tell us a little bit of your background? Who is Bill Gussie, and how did you get to this point in your life today? Well, that's a great question in this um, atmosphere because it certainly was uh, up to God uh, how I am where I am, and really all praise to him because it's been kind of a long and winding road I, I lived. Uh, I grew up in Sheboygan County, and lived in Sheboygan Falls until graduating from high school there. I went to Marquette University and ended up back home after college. Honestly, I went to college thinking I knew what I wanted to do, and honestly, I had no clue. Uh, I, I did not really sought out what God wanted me to do, and my dad had advised me, and that was probably God speaking through my dad. He said, Bill, you, you should be a teacher and a coach. You'd be really good at that. I said, Dad, yeah, but they don't make any money, so <laughs> forget it. And I went through with that attitude that success was really going to be determined on your paycheck. And I learned quickly that that wasn't really true. Uh, and if it was, I was going to be miserable uh, because I wasn't anywhere near where I wanted to be financially. So uh, after college, I started working at Heritage Insurance, which is now Acuity, and worked in the big building and uh, run by Bells, and John Holden was the president at the time. It was a very unique uh, corporate atmosphere where they had buzzers or bells that would uh, let you know when you could go for lunch, when lunch was done, when you could go for leave for the day, when you, the day would start. And it was a very male-dominated place. Uh, we had a summer picnic where only the ladies would participate in uh, events, track events. Uh, it was it was really weird, uh, quite sexist. So uh, it was a great start for me, though. I was able to coach freshman basketball at Sheboygan Falls High School and while I was there. And then until I, uh, one of the, uh, the ladies that I worked with moved to Green Bay, and she started working for Employers Health Insurance. And so I actually followed her. Then I interviewed when they had an opening and was able to move forward and uh, move up here to Green Bay, and that was 1988, March of 88. And uh, it was funny because uh, employers' health insurance had like reportedly 91.2 percent women. So as a single guy, I was pretty excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty excited for those uh, those odds. But, yeah, but anyway, um, oh, the Lord wasn't thinking that way. So. <laughs> somebody from back home but anyway so there I, I went as an actuary and I, th- well, I knew that an actuary was a field that could make quite a bit of money and mm-hmm. but the 
the mathematics exams were <laughs> not my specialty. And, and honestly, if you're going to be an actuary, you should go to school as an actuary because then you can pass quite a few exams before you leave. And it helps you attain certain levels of professional accomplishment. And then your salary is commensurately raised. And so that was honestly because of, of my experiences at Marquette, which included uh, playing club baseball four years and then also being a walk-on for the Marquette Warriors two years with Doc Rivers, as a matter of fact, a new Bucks coach. Uh, those things were great accomplishments for me and actually gave me some confidence. But, boy, I was changing my degree. It actually took me five years to graduate, which, honestly, being voted most likely to succeed in my class, that was a failure. Mm -hmm. And it drilled me to the core, kind of, because if my classmates would know that it took me five years, they would have thought I was a, you know, a big dummy, but... Mm -hmm. Honestly, it was shame-induced mm -hmm. on my part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, honestly, the actuarial exams as well, I, I did not succeed at those. Mm -hmm. And that was a challenge for me to accept. And it's amazing how God has worked through that. And I had pride that I needed to submit, and I was learning how to do that in my, my path. And I wouldn't even say that I had a walk with the Lord yet at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, Dad was a regular soloist in church, sang in the choir. Mm -hmm. I took piano lessons for 10 years, so, you know, I had my share of, of classical pieces that I learned and played and uh, mastered, but I really didn't have a walk with the Lord. And, and that took place later when I was able to, as living in the town of Morrison in southeast Brown County, mm -hmm. uh, I was attending Zion uh, Lutheran Church in Wayside, and I got involved with a men's Bible study there. And it was a wonderful experience because there was a Catholic priest there, Father Bob Cabot. Uh, I've uh, heard of him, yeah. <laughs> yeah. neighbor down the street. Yeah. 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 Uh, there was a Lutheran pastor. There were non-denominational gentlemen there. And it was amazing to see men profess their faith like they were. Mm -hmm. And it really had a profound effect on me and, and really got my walk with the Lord going. And, and certainly we continue to perfect that every day as we mm -hmm. proceed, but... But still, you know, as far as career goes, actuarial science was not it. That's not what the Lord wanted me to do. And I really tried to help, ask him to help me find what he really wanted me to do. And so it was interesting how he, he took me to a couple of different spots uh, while living in, actually out in the Wayside then, not the town of Morrison anymore. Well, still part of, I think, the town of Morrison where Wayside is. But there's Morrison and Wayside if you've ever been out there. But nonetheless, uh, we lived there, and I was commuting to Sheboygan to work for HSA Bank, mm -hmm. which is all about health savings accounts. And mm -hmm. But I was there 15 months, I think 10 months. And then I was really kind of like the president's right-hand statistical guy and mm -hmm. was producing monthly reports on the stats of, of how many health savings accounts we were selling and so on and so forth. And um, I ended up having my position eliminated there. And and that was a challenge, and mm -hmm. that wasn't the first one. There was one, actually, when I worked at AMS after Employers Health Insurance, mm -hmm. there they were making cutbacks when it, it transitioned, and my position was eliminated there, and you get walked out. It's not really a fun feeling. Right. Oh, gosh. So I'm trying to say, all right, Lord, you obviously don't want me in the corporate world. Where do you want me? So then uh, Providence Academy had an opening and I had made some connections with certain people and they needed a headmaster. And I said, well, I have no educational background. I said, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll help you with that. <laughs> you have, you know, the godly character we want. You have the background that we want. And I think you can do a great job. So we went from 44 kids to almost a hundred kids when I was there in a couple of years, two and a half years, I think. And then their budget kind of sunk, and then my position was eliminated because I wasn't a teacher. Mm -hmm. So they were looking for a, then a headmaster that could also teach, and mm -hmm. that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. So I was eliminated there. But then I had gotten to know a lady named Judy Decker, who was the president of the BMO Harris Bank mm -hmm. on Military. And Judy, I told her, I said, Judy, I, you know, I'm not going to be coming in anymore because my position's been eliminated, and I'll be moving on. And she said, well, I'll keep my eyes and ears open for you. And she did. And then in the summer, she called me and she said, hey, you know what? St. Vincent de Paul is looking for an executive director. So this is July of 2012. And I said, really? Oh, that's cool. And she said, yeah, I think you'd be really good at it. You should apply for it. Okay. So I went and discovered that in an online process, 
to apply for that, and I did. And I know that the deadline was October 21st because that's my birthday, and so I remember that date specifically. But So the night before, Judy reaches out to me, and she says, Hey, I thought you were going to apply for that job at St. Vincent de Paul. And, well, I did. She said, yeah, but your resume is not in the pile. Can you get it to me tonight? I'll make sure it's in the pile. I'm on the committee, and <laughs> and I'll get you noticed. And sure enough, I got called in for an interview, and there were a lot of different people that I now know from St. Vincent de Paul, but during the interview process, but it was interesting. And, you know, I just feel that that was God making sure that I got mm -hmm. there because he wanted me there. And How he worked through her. That, yeah, you know, all these different people mm -hmm. that that the Lord was mm -hmm. utilizing to help me end up there. And how long have you been there now? Now, 11 years. 11 years, wow. So okay. that's, yeah, that's been a wonderful mm -hmm. treat, mm -hmm. uh, unexpected treat. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I know that. And here's proof, too, that the Lord is watching there was one time when I had to eliminate somebody mm -hmm. and there were some challenges from the beginning because I inherited a group of people that didn't know me, mm -hmm. didn't necessarily, I think, appreciate me. And I, I had learned a lot about St. Vince de Paul and it's, it's really an, an amazing organization. But at that time, you know, some of these people were bucking what we were trying to, I was trying to implement and try to change and transition to and, they weren't feeling it. So I felt certain people had to be removed mm -hmm. from the staff so we could go forward. And one day <clears throat> I felt, man, I don't know if this is for me. It's not fun for anybody to have to dismiss someone, right? And sure. But you got to do what's right for the big picture. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to do. And, you know, you get the gut ache for mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. if, you, if you really care about what you're doing. I was going to say, if you care, if you, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, you, if do. you don't care about people, yeah. then no problem. No big deal. Yeah, Hard but I, I got the yeah. stomach aches and I said mm -hmm. to my wife, and Debbie, I said, I don't know if I belong at St. Vincent de Paul. And she said, no, wait a minute. You said when you got hired, you felt that God brought you there, right? Yep, I do. She said, so now you're saying that God made a mistake? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, said, well, I guess you're right. I don't want okay, great. Thank okay. you. <laughs> All those wives, they put it in perspective, right? <laughs> yeah, she did. And she was fantastic for that. So kind of in a nutshell, nutshell it's a big nutshell, but... <laughs> That brings you up to date. Yeah, that's excellent. So there seems to be a lot of dimensions of St. Vincent de Paul from the Vincentians doing home visits mm -hmm. and helping people uh, a little bit, you know, struggling around the margins to the thrift stores to a lot of different things that you got going on. So how's that all work together, and especially your role as executive director? How do you hold it all together? Well, as executive director, really, I'm the, the CEO of this business mm -hmm. that happens to be a charity and uh, it is a wonderful charity, and I'll tell you, I recommend that if you guys want a special experience, I recommend you go on a home visit. It, it is an amazing experience. I've I've done about a handful. You know, they have enough incentives; they don't need me for sure. But um, one of our past presidents was his his partner canceled that last minute, and he said, "Bill, you want to go on a home visit?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I'm free. I can go with you." And went out to Denmark actually, and there was a gentleman there that was. Immobilized, really. He was uh, having a hard time physically, and and he was in this little house that may have been a thousand square mm. feet, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of, a thousand square feet, maybe. It was probably close. It was probably less than that. But anyway, he was on disability, and he was just so grateful that we were there and that we were there to listen and and just hear what his story was and the challenges that he was going through and. Mm. And Ken is very good as as a Vincentian on home visits, and he's just a great listener. And he's a longtime bachelor, so he, you know, he, he it's amazing. I, he's very impressed. He has impressed me and how empathetic he is when he goes on those visits. But I'll tell you, I was so moved that day. And that's the thing: is if a Vincentian is doing it the right way, going on a home visit the right way. They should be looking to see the face of Christ in those that were serving at that moment. Mm -hmm. And then those people should be able to see the face of Christ in us. Hmm. And that's when it's done right. But the the neat thing about that is that the, the culture beliefs of St. Vince de Paul are such that you should grow spiritually first. It's not you should be good at serving people first. Hmm. That's actually third. It's first growing spiritually. Secondly, that you work as a team. And then third that you then serve others. Mm -hmm. And if you get those three in order, mm -hmm. you're going to be a pretty good Vincentian. Mm -hmm. And we have some mm -hmm. amazing Vincentians that do that. And boy, they just don't notice. 
You know, there's a guy that came, uh, we could see our, the bus line goes, comes in front of our offices and there was a gentleman there that had soiled his pants. And I said to Ken, I said, Ken, I think there's a guy outside that, you know, could use it. You could use your help. And I was thinking, well, why aren't you going, Bill? And mm-hmm. honestly, it caused me to hesitate. And mm-hmm. that's why I give them so much credit. Ken said, oh, I'll take care of him. Boom, out the door he went. And I went right after the guy. I said, hey, you know what? We can get you some new pants. And mm-hmm. brought him back in. And sure enough, cleaned him up uh, and got him some pants. And that gentleman had a much more pleasant bus ride that mm-hmm. afternoon than he would have otherwise. But how many Vincentians are there and how many home visits do they typically do in a month's time, let's say? Oh, it depends on the location, for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, we have some that are in more affluent areas that don't. Uh, they may specialize in nursing home visits or something mm-hmm. like that instead. But uh, I'll say, for instance, Cathedral downtown, St. Francis Xavier mm-hmm. Cathedral, mm-hmm. you know, they may have 15 to 20 home visits in a week. So you need to have enough Vincentian uh, teams that can go out because we are supposed to go out in pairs. Mm-hmm. That's you know, as the Lord taught the disciples, right? Mm-hmm. And right. we need to go with humility and non judgmental, and if you're going to do it right. And, so they, yeah, they do a lot there. And uh, there are other groups that have, they don't have as many members, so then it makes it harder. And it can be, you know, it can be overwhelming after a time if there's not enough members and you got a ton of home visits. Mm-hmm. But boy, if you keep it in the right frame of mind, it's an amazing, I, I think it's, it's mm-hmm. probably the best charity there is because of that. So a lot of people are just kind of familiar with St. Vincent de Paul as the thrift store. Mm-hmm. Like right. that's all they really know. Mm-hmm. What is all encompassing of St. Vincent de Paul? What do you guys all do? Well, what what I just described really is the fundamental because St. Vincent de Paul can exist and does exist without thrift stores. Mm-hmm. Thrift stores really is just a revenue stream to help support the programs that you're going to go out and, mm-hmm. and and turn around really and give that those donations back to the community. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we have four stores counting our dig and save outlet. But honestly, right now, the stores don't even keep up with what we gave. We gave away over a million dollars directly and indirectly in support this last year. So it's it's amazing how much that's gone up and actually continues to grow. And you ultimately oversee all four of those stores. Yep. yep. Yeah. I'm yeah. responsible for all four stores uh, as the CEO and ED. Mm-hmm. So I have a director of operations, Paul Eilenfeld, mm-hmm. who you guys may know. Uh, yes, yes. Matthews. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've got some people doing great work. The Vincentians, but also the people who come into your store to shop. Can you tell us a little bit about the people whom you're serving? Who are the people who are the recipients of St. Vincent de Paul services? Yeah. Well, really, the you know, obviously the stores are open to anybody and everybody. Mm-hmm. So we have all walks of life that come into the stores. But half of my sports jackets and ties come from the <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm and I'm not, you know, I'm like that's great, you know. Right. One of my favorite sweaters is from the West Side Store. A donation at the West Side Store. But anyway, uh, the recipients certainly are uh, anybody and everybody. There's people that are are physically challenged. Uh, I know one time I went on the point in time count to help count the homeless in the community. And uh, we found this gentleman that was, um, he was burrowed. He had a cave built kind of under a cattails mm-hmm. behind Sullivan school between Sullivan school and uh, Riverside ballroom mm-hmm. in that area. And he didn't want to be discovered. Mm-hmm. He didn't want his home taken away. He didn't want to be forced to move on. That's commonly what happens, but there are different degrees. I mean, if you just talk about homelessness, there's different degrees of homelessness. There are those that can immediately be helped. Maybe it's just a situational setback and they just lost their job and obviously couldn't pay their rent. So now they've been kicked out. But so they may be short term homeless, but there are those that are chronically homeless. As you have I've known that there's people that have been homeless 15, 20 years. Uh, certainly they're going through something more than just a physical situation and there's a lot of mental but you know what when you think about it when i try to put myself in their places places and try to empathize i think what it would be like to wonder let's see where am i gonna sleep tonight mm-hmm. or what or if if i'm am i gonna eat today and i just that's when that first time i went out 
I, I did all nighter and I came home at six thirty in the morning, whatever it was. And I was in my driveway. I was crying mm -hmm. and I just, I brushed it off that I was just tired, but it wasn't that mm -hmm. I was affected by what I saw. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful for what I do have because I could easily be in the, on the other end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are people that, yep, they need financial assistance. There are people that need uh, substance foods and whatnot. There are people that just need someone to listen to them mm -hmm. and it's amazing what that can do for those mm -hmm. when they understand that saint vincent paul of incentions are coming to pray with them because like for instance a story from the marinette saint vincent paul and which is a separate organization but you know we we collaborate we help each other out but uh, one of their past presidents up there she told me a story one time that they had run out of money and they had this home visit waiting and um, she actually told the, the party right away. She said, just, you know, we're out of money, so we're not going to be able to help you financially. And she said, that's okay, but you're going to come and pray with me, right? Boom. That was mm -hmm. a big thing. And I thought, oh, my gosh, how meaningful is that? Mm -hmm. She said, you bet. We'll come. She said, okay, good. I just need someone to talk to today and someone to pray with me. So that's what they did. And that's that's mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. So how, how would somebody become a Vincentian? How do you become a Vincentian? Really, it's just to have a, a, a real commitment to want to make a difference. Um, my wife just recently joined St. Agnes Parish as a conference here in town. So, you know, here's to kind of how the Lord has a sense of humor. <laughs> Thanks to St. Vincent Paul Green Bay and the way they have it set up, me being a non-Catholic can actually be the ED there. There are some organizations around the country that require a Catholic to be their ED. They require a Catholic to be their director of development, associate ED, so on and so forth. They don't hear. So I've been able to work through that. And I actually have a, a kind of a funny story where I had dinner with Hector Cologne, who's head of Lutheran Social Services in yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, okay. He's actually a Catholic that runs that Lutheran organization. And I'm a Lutheran that runs this Catholic organization. <laughs> so that's all the Lord's things together, right? Yes, yeah. As long as our intention right. is, is great. Absolutely. Yep, that's doing great. So mm -hmm. um, Vincentians got to have a love to help others. Got to be able to handle certain situations. And the neat thing is that when you just start out, you usually will go with a veteran if they do it right. Uh, they'll pair with kind of like a, a home visit mentor. And you'll go and you'll watch and you'll learn and you figure it out and you provide support at that time and until you have confidence to do a home visit um, as a lead yourself. Uh, you wouldn't go by yourself, but as a lead in that pair. Uh, so it's it's really and like I said, it's an amazing experience. And that'd only be one way to volunteer, right? So you could also you be working in the store, sorting yeah. things as well, correct? Yeah, we have Vincentians that will actually uh, do home visits as well as help in the store. Mm -hmm. But we do have people, uh, tons of volunteers mm -hmm. that work in our store that mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily Vincentians, mm -hmm. but they do an amazing thing too. Mm -hmm. And some of the volunteers are actually better than some of our employees. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's there's a lot of opportunities to do good to do good for sure yeah we've had a number of people volunteer on our service Saturdays over at uh, your place mm -hmm. and um, I've always found it to be very very meaningful and mm -hmm. um, I also just want to say too I mean uh, whatsoever you do has our Spokes of Hope program yeah. uh, running out of St. Vincent de Paul and that's been a really great collaboration between two organizations um, do you, do you, does St. Vincent de Paul collaborate with other organizations in town as well we do, uh, not necessarily in that same manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not supposed to give, by rules, we're not supposed to give financial assistance to other right. organizations that aren't St. Vince de Paul. Sure. So the fact that, you know, we do it gratis, mm -hmm. no big deal, mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. it works mm -hmm. great, and it's really helped you guys, helped us mm -hmm. too, though, yeah. too, because kind of win -win. we were having a hard time finding bike volunteers that were loyal mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. dedicated and right. stuck around, you know, right. some, in, some persistence, and yeah. so you guys have helped with that tremendously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. I just want to have a little fun with this uh, uh -oh. as we move towards the end of our conversation here. You know, I know, as you mentioned earlier, you were a basketball star. I think I think you said star, right? No, At Marquette <laughs> University. No. I, I okay. heard star. I heard star. You put a word in your mouth <laughs> back in the 80s. And, and then there was this guy, like you said, there was this guy named Doc Rivers um, who happens to be the new basketball coach. And, uh, for the Milwaukee Bucks, and and so I'm just curious. I guess my last question is like, how, what was it like to carry Doc Rivers on your back all those years at Marquette? Well, when when <laughs> in practice that I assumed that I actually did that, <laughs> he didn't necessarily agree because <laughs> there was a day in practice when I I was I set up a perfect. I was in defensive position perfectly, and I, he drilled me. 
and he got called for a charge. And his response wasn't exactly pleasant. <laughs> I don't know if you would remember that, but uh, I'll tell you, the Marquette days were amazing, and Doc Rivers certainly played a part of that. But So there was, I have to tell you, this, this, is, this is the Lord doing some humility, but there was an opportunity for me to live in infamy, and this picture still might exist somewhere, but uh, there was a bar down there, a campus bar called the Gym Bar, and it was very much Marquette basketball oriented, and a lot of pictures in the place, and so we would go there quite often and, and wait for different friends to show up. And well, there was this one picture where Doc Rivers was being announced for the starting lineups, and and he came out, he had his arm up in the air, and well, my picture was right under his arm because <laughs> I was, you know, lining the, the way for them to go out onto the floor and get cheered at. And I thought, oh man, that's great! I'll be here forever. <laughs> well, the gym bar is gone, and I have no idea where that picture went, but I sure would. Love a copy of it if it's possible. But do you stay in touch at all with Doc? I tried actually yeah. when uh, when I started writing this second book of mine that I'm working on for that sportsmanship ministry you mentioned, and uh, when he was with Philadelphia, mm. and I wasn't able to get hold of him, I sent him a couple letters, and he wasn't able to respond. And, yeah. mm. You know, I get it. I, I don't even know if he ever even saw them, right? Yeah, yeah. sure. And I tried actually his wife's brother lived next door in Racine to a baseball teammate of mine. Hmm. So Steve, his name, gave me the number of her brother who would, might know Doc Rivers' cell phone number, right? So that, I went through this... Seven degrees of separation <laughs> from Doc Rivers. Right. And I was trying to get a hold of them. I got to call him. Well, that guy never answered and didn't respond. So okay. I'm still trying to get a hold of him. And, but actually, him being in town might actually benefit me then in two ways that he can help me. Meets Shaka Smart then too. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So I'd like to interview him as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, good idea. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, you talked about how the sacred has really been alive and, and strong in your life. Where do you see God really working in your everyday life? So, where is God showing his presence in your everyday life? And especially through the work of St. Vincent de Paul. Well, I'll tell you, he's. Um, <laughs> he, he's overdone it. There was a, a Saturday morning when the, the dog and I were going walking. I go walking really early in the morning. I, I mean, insanely early. It's, uh, I'll, I'll run past Res here at you know, 3.45 in the morning with the dog. And it is we're insanely off. early. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's, it's amazing prayer time and private time with the Lord, and there's not really any distractions. Uh, very soundproof. <laughs> Well, one day I prayed for finances for St. Mr. Mm -hmm. Paul. It was amazing because I was on a Saturday morning, as I said, and the following Tuesday, so just you know, two, three days later, we got this bequest in the mail, unexpected bequest, for like $150,000. I said, oh, my gosh, Lord, this is amazing. You don't have to work that fast. <laughs> this is great. I couldn't be more grateful. And so there was a great example, I believe, I believe that I've been there 11 years, you know, and in my situation and uh, as a non-Catholic, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm, I'm convinced that he plays a role in that because um, I've survived some people going to the bishop wanting to get rid of me because I'm not Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I really feel that he's he's worked through that. I, and the people that I had to get rid of and to dismiss, I think he played a role in all that wanting me to help and aim and guide this organization forward. <clears throat> and honestly, it's three of the last the last three years really have been three of the organization's best since I've been there. And I can only be grateful for that, for sure, and, and give it to all God. Well, Bill, thank you so much for spending some time with us and in conversation. And um, I am convinced that you are the right person for that organization and for this community because you give so much to St. Vincent de Paul, but through St. Vincent de Paul, you give so much to this community of Green Thank Bay you. and the greater Green Bay community. So thanks for all you do. Thanks for your dedication. Thanks for these years, 11 years of, of doing nonprofit work and leading a really, really important nonprofit. I know there's a lot of resurrection people who are involved in St. Vincent de Paul, but I also know there's a whole bunch of other people, not just oh, yeah. not just Catholics, but people of all faiths or no faiths involved in yeah. the work of St. Vincent de Paul. And it just brings me back to 
um, that quote that Katie started with in terms of we find great joy in serving others. And I can tell that you find great joy in doing the same. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. much for being with us. Yeah, thanks for the both of you. Yes. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on this episode of Revealed. And until next time. Keep looking for the sacred in the ordinary. This has been Revealed, a podcast sponsored by Resurrection Catholic Parish in Green Bay, Wisconsin.